Remember the boss Magma Rock in the Fire and Ice dungeon? It's part of another quest of Flag that we still need to get. Magma Rock shoots fireballs and when he gets below half of his health he will heal himself up. Here's a clip from the Let's Play episode. Okay, let's try this again. Yeah, that's easy. Easy! Easy, look at these skills I have. This movement. Oh shit, what is he doing now? He healed. He healed. Like I mentioned previously, the motivation for me to make the series came from Antonin Beaujean asking me originally to make videos about Pwn Adventure 3 and he shared his workshop slides covering Pwn Adventure 3 with me. However, the CTF has always been something I wanted to do myself, so he was a huge help and was of course the spark to motivate me to finally do it. And that means I didn't want any spoilers, but he did spoiler me a little bit. In his very first message to me, he suggested that I could make a video about the double integer overflow to kill the boss. Dun dun dun. So anyway, I knew that we had to kill Magma Rock with one or two integer overflows. And I'm not going to pretend I didn't know that and make up a story how I figured it out myself. Nevertheless, I think it's still interesting to actually find it. It happens sometimes that you hear a software has a certain bug, but not technical details are known yet, so you have to find it yourself. And that's what I tried to do. The past few videos were about reverse engineering the network protocol, developing our proxy and parsing packets, and I will be using that heavily here. I added again a few more packets to the parser off camera. One new packet in particular is very important here, and that is the update health packet. It's a simple packet, it is sent from the server to the client and comes with a health value and an ID to identify whose health it is. You might discover this packet when you get damaged and slowly regenerate. But you also get the health value of the monsters that you damage. While implementing this, I first defined the health to be an unsigned integer indicated by the capital I when unpacking the binary data. Though, when I killed the spider, I noticed that the health suddenly is extremely large, and that doesn't make sense. So this means we interpreted the binary data wrong. In fact, this tells me this is supposed to be a signed integer. Unsigned integers are just positive numbers, while signed integers means that certain binary values are interpreted as negative numbers, and changing the parsing to a lowercase i shows us now a nice negative value for when we kill the spider. So we keep in mind that the health is a signed value. I don't want to explain here in detail how signed and unsigned numbers work, so I created a short bonus episode for those of you who need some additional information. But with this knowledge we can put together a plan to find this mysterious integer overflow. We are looking for where unsigned and signed numbers are somehow carelessly mixed together. In assembly this means we are looking for signed and unsigned operations. In the bonus video I have shown you that addition works perfectly fine with signed and unsigned values, so that wouldn't be a difference in assembler. The difference is in how we interpret this data, and one such interpretation happens with comparisons. Because with signed values a minus 1 is smaller than a 1, but the equivalent unsigned value, a hex FFFF 4.2 billions, is much larger than a 1. And in x86 assembler we have different instructions for that. For example for a signed comparison we would do JLE, jump if less or equal, while with unsigned values we would do jump BE, jump if below or equal. So greater and less than are signed interpretations of data, while above and below is the unsigned interpretation. And that helps us now with our plan. We essentially look for where a signed value, like the health, is handled with an unsigned instruction, like below or above. Or the other way around, if we take an unsigned value and compare it with less or greater instructions. So a good start to look is the damage function for Magmarok. Because in the end, dealing damage to Magmarok is the only way how we as a player can interact with him. Or in more abstract terms, that is the only input we can give to the Magmarok program. This function takes an actor, an item, the amount of damage and the damage type as parameters. We can control the damage and type of damage based on the weapon or spell we use. 
From our time debugging the game with GDB or from enums IDA recognized, we know that there is physical damage, fire damage, cold damage and shock damage. If we compare a little bit how IDA and Binary Ninja disassemble the damage function, we can see that IDA displays a bit more information. In fact, it names certain variables it was able to get from the debug information embedded in the binary. But we can do some of this by hand in Binary Ninja as well. You see that it shows the types of the parameters here, but didn't set the type or name of the parameters. So we know arg1 is the this pointer, pointing to the Magmarok object itself. This is an actor, probably our player, an item, and damage and damage type. And we can also see here, based on the calling convention, which parameters correspond to which register, and thus we know what kind of local variables are set here from the parameters. But if we compare that now to IDA, we realize that something is not right. IDA said that the type would come from RSI, while we thought R8 is the source. So what is true now? Well, if you would blindly rely on IDA, you would have a hard time understanding what's going on. But this is only true for IDA64 free version. I don't know if it was a bug or if this analysis is only a feature from more advanced plugins in the pro version. But when I ask my friend to open it in a recent version, then IDA Pro does it correct. So the point of the story is, I rarely rely on one tool. I don't understand IDA or any other tool well enough to be able to figure out issues like this. I'm sure a professional reverse engineer has no issues with that. But I like to compare the output from Binary Ninja, IDA, Hopper, Radare and whatever. It helps me understand this stuff better. Anyway, let's have a closer look. First we compare the damage type to 1. If it was not equal to 1, we go over here. So if it's not fire damage because that is type 1. Then we check if it's cold damage type 2. If it's equal, we would go down here, but if it's not equal, so any other kind of damage, we load a 2 into EAX, move it into this address here, load the damage amount into ECX, load the 2 again down here, and then perform a division. So we divide the damage by 2. However, if the damage was fire damage, we go into this crazy block and XMM registers usually means that there are some floating point calculations. And there's a power float function, so it takes some value to the power of something. Reading this forward is always a bit ugly, but we can also backtrace. So after all of this, the damage is set from EAX. And EAX comes from this variable, but is subtracted from zero. So this makes it negative. This means the damage value that was calculated is actually more like a healing value. Negative damage is healing. So let's rename it to healing. And healing could be set in this block to whatever is in this unknown variable. But healing is only set here if the condition before is false. And it compares here the healing to that unknown value. So if this unknown value is smaller than the healing, then healing is set to that value. Which means there is a cap on the amount of healing that is calculated. So doing healing larger than that value is not allowed. And don't forget, we are hunting for an integer overflow, so we need to pay attention to these comparisons and here we have JBE, which is an unsigned comparison. And this unknown value is the result of a subtraction from a fixed value, hex 2710, which is 10,000 in decimal. And it's subtracting a value stored at the offset hex 38 from RIX, and RIX is this. This is a pointer to the current Magmarok object. So taking an offset from that address means we are referring to an attribute of Magmarok. Let's investigate this with GDB. First, we need to set a breakpoint somewhere in this function. And this is an external library. We can't simply copy the address here. But GDB knows the symbols and addresses, so we can just disassemble the Magmarok damage function and also set a breakpoint there. Now, we just have to walk up to Magmarok and shoot with something at him to trigger the damage function and we hit the breakpoint. Let's walk a few steps forward so the function prolog is done. And then print this. So you can see this is a pointer to a Magmarok object. And by dereferencing the pointer when printing we can also print the whole object, including the attributes coming from inherited classes such as actor. So for example Magmarok has 10,000 health or he has an attribute if healing is active. And we know he can heal himself. With GDB, we can also now learn more about the offsets. 
For example, we can get the address of where mHealth is stored and calculate the offset from where MagmaRock starts, which turns out to be hex 38, and the healing active attribute at offset hex 148. I've chosen those two because they will be important, but of course you could map out all of them like that. And that is super useful for reversing with the disassembler. We now head to the structures in Binary Ninja and create a new one that we call MagmaRock. And let's give it some size like hex 150. So we can fit both attributes we know in there. Now we don't know the other fields, but we know that at offset hex 38 we have an integer health and at hex 148 we have a bool for healing active. Then we go back to our damage function and change the type from the default integer that was set for this to a magmarock pointer. And now look, the pointer was automatically resolved and Binary Ninja can tell us now that this is an offset to the health. Cool, right? So defining structures once you learn more about what stuff means is part of reversing, like renaming functions and variables and so forth. You slowly build up the whole picture. Now, we know the current health of Magmarok is subtracted from 10,000, so our unknown value could be called health difference. It's a difference between the full health and where Magmarok currently is at. So if the health difference is smaller than the healing we wanted to do, then the healing is kept at the difference. Let's do an example. If Magmarok has 9,800 health, then the difference is 200. And when we try to heal for 500 health points, then that would be larger than 200, then the healing would be kept, set to that value. So we can't heal more than up to 10,000. Now remember, here we have an unsigned comparison on the result of a hard-coded 10,000 minus the current health of Magmarok. And subtraction is always very tricky, there is no check if the health is larger than 10,000. So this unsigned comparison could really screw up if the health of Magmarok were larger than 10,000. For example, if the health were 15,000, then subtracting 15,000 from 10,000 would result in minus 5,000, if interpreted as a signed value. But minus 5,000 is a huge value if interpreted as unsigned. And so this unsigned check JBE would interpret the result as hex FFFEC78 or 2.5 billion. So if we now would try to heal for 5000 HP, then the check would say, no, 2.5 billion is not smaller than what we tried to heal, so we don't cap and allow to heal. If this would have been a signed check, so JLE, jump if less or equal, then yeah, it would be interpreted as minus 5000, which would be smaller than the 500 we tried to heal. So this thing here could be unsafe if we somehow can get the health of Magmarok higher than 10,000. If it's not higher than 10,000, then the subtraction would not overflow the integer and apply a cap to the healing. So while we can heal Magmarok with fireballs, this check will always prevent us to heal higher than 10,000. So it's kind of like a chicken and egg problem, right? If the health would be higher than 10k, we could heal him even higher, but if the health is below or equal to 10k, we can only heal him up to 10k. But theoretically, we know that the health is assigned integer, we know that from killing spiders that had a negative health, so if we can keep healing Magmarok so high that the value doesn't fit in a 32-bit signed integer anymore, it overflows, wraps around to a negative value, then Magmarok would be instantly dead. Hmm. But the problem is, by itself this function here is safe. We can't heal over 10k. But we know that Magmarok can also heal himself. So there's a second logic somewhere that manipulates Magmarok's health. So if we somehow can abuse that to get over 10,000 health, then we have a clear path laid out to kill Magmarok. So now, how do we find that? A good way to start is just by looking at the other Magmarok functions. And the tick is a function that is constantly called. It's a tick, like on a clock. This function exists for a lot of objects, so they can update their behavior according to the game's time. So if Magmarok would do something, it most likely would originate from in here. Like with any object function, the first parameter is the this pointer. This parameter points to the current Magmarok object and is passed in via RDI. And so here we can see RDI is used a few times. So we can change all the types to a Magmarok pointer. And we can already see that here it checks if healing is active. And the health is referenced multiple times as well. Now if the healing is 1, so true, 
active, we check if the health is less or equal to zero, basically checking if Mark Morocco is still alive. And as you know, this is a signed comparison, so a negative health would be interpreted here properly. Then we check if Magmarok's health is greater than or equal to 5000, which we know is a trigger for healing. When we got him to 50% health, he initiated his healing sequence. So if healing is not active, he is not dead and health is under 5000, he will switch into healing mode. At least that's what I guess, I haven't really reversed how the states work in this game. I just see something is referenced here and it would make sense to me. But we are looking for where the health is modified. So let's look for something that sets or modifies the health. I really wish we could look for cross references to the health attribute. Anyway, here's one example. The health is moved into ECX, then we add hex 136F to it, that's 4975 in decimal, and the result of the addition is moved into health. So we know there is a delay between Magmarok going into healing, where he does his animation, and then actually healing up. Do you see the issue? There's a race condition here, a time of check, time of use kind of thing. The decision if Magmarok is going to heal is decided when he falls under 5000 HP, but then the actual healing happens later. And the healing is not just setting the health back to 10k, it's actually adding 4975 to the health. This means we can push Magmarok over 10,000 health. We just have to kick him into healing mode by damaging him. And as soon as he falls under 5000 and he decides he's going to heal, but first has to cast his spell and the animation starts, we quickly switch to fireballs to heal him back up over 5025 health. Because then, a few seconds later, his healing spell succeeds and heals him up for 4975 HP, which then pushes him over 10k. And by pushing him over 10k, we know we can bypass this healing cap and keep healing him with fireballs. And that could maybe kill him, because healing too much can cause an integer overflow of his health, making his health suddenly negative and thus instantly kill him. To pull that off, I modified the network proxy a bit. I shoot the great balls of fire and zero cool straight down and collect those packets. Both of these packets cause the magic spell being shot straight down. And we also know the position of magma rock from the actors list. So what we can do is, we can craft a position update packet and tell the server we are standing above Magmarok by setting a higher Z value than him. And then we send the shoot packet. And because we never actually moved there, the client will keep sending the real position updates. This means the server thinks we are always teleporting above Magmarok, shoot a spell and teleport back behind the safe chest. I was thinking about how to trigger this from the game and decided to place the creation and injection of these packets into the sneaking parser. So when we press down the sneak button, this packet is sent to the server, we parse it here and maybe decide to inject the two packets into the traffic. And this makes fireballs or ice balls rain onto Magmarok. Cool, huh? We basically invented a new spell, a meteor shower. So all we have to do now is carefully damage him with cold spells or other attacks and observe his health. Once we get close to 5000, we have to be careful. Okay, now a bit of damage is missing. Now I take it slow. I exchange the zero cool spell with the great boss of fire spell. So pressing sneak now will cast a fireball on him that will also heal him. Then I switch to a pistol with low damage, shoot him with it, and this pushes him under 5000 HP and initiate his healing sequence. Now we have a couple of seconds time to heal him above the threshold with some fireballs by pressing sneak. Healing is coming? Okay, we were successful. His healing spell is over, he healed up and his health is above 10k. Now we just have to keep healing him. And that should eventually kill him. See how he sometimes shoots up? That's because even though we stand here, we tell the server we are actually above him to shoot a fireball. So for a split second, Magmarok thinks we are there. You can see here the signed and unsigned raw byte values as a comparison. At some point his health will overflow and kill him. Quest complete, fire and ice. Let's loot the chest. Acquired flag of the lava. Some bosses just roll over and die. 